The views, information, or opinions expressed during this recording are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Alberta Health Services and its employees. This is Long COVID, the pandemic after the pandemic, an Alberta Health Services webinar and podcast series. Long COVID is now being recognized as a new chronic condition that is becoming better understood across the globe. We aim to support our healthcare providers and caregivers to find and use appropriate resources for themselves, their patients, and clients. We'll share stories from patients and providers and explore the innovative work being done in Alberta, across Canada, and globally to support Long COVID. This series will help raise awareness of all the work that's being done to understand and address this complex puzzle. Hello and welcome. This is Long COVID, the pandemic after the pandemic. It's an Alberta Health Services webinar and podcast series, and I'm your host, Shauna Curry. This is our second webinar where we're going to interview healthcare professionals across different disciplines to get an understanding of what it's like to treat patients with a new chronic condition that we're still learning about. We'll explore their thoughts and what patients wish healthcare providers knew to discuss opportunities for care going forward. This webinar is being recorded, and if you're calling in, we just ask that you mute your phone. If you do have any questions for our guests, you can type them into the chat box and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of today's episode. There are many terms for COVID-19 symptoms that last longer than the initial phase of infection. Some of the terms you may have heard include post-COVID syndrome, post-acute COVID, uh, long haulers, or long COVID. When we refer to long COVID, we'll be talking about the collection of over 200 different symptoms that last longer than 12 weeks after an initial COVID-19 infection. Today, we'll have a panel of four healthcare providers who are on the show to talk about their unique perspective um, across the different care continuums and across the country. We're going to be exploring long COVID through the lens of physicians, allied healthcare, rehabilitation, uh, internal medicine, and we're going to explore the patient journey across the spectrum and highlight some of the great work that's being done to support patients with long COVID. Our first guest today is Dr. Jillian Walsh. She is the medical director of the Calgary Long COVID IPOP clinics, is on several provincial committees and supervising the development of IPOP programs in Alberta. Dr. Walsh is trained as a general internal medicine specialist with a focus on chronic disease management. She worked consistently on the inpatient and acute COVID service in both Red Deer and Calgary since the onset of COVID in 2020. She also has a master's in health economics and is completing a postdoctoral fellowship in this field with a focus on the evaluation of innovative care delivery models, including those that employ similar virtual care tools as being employed in the COVID IPOC clinics. Now, Dr. Walsh, in Alberta, we have a few multidisciplinary clinics to support patients with long COVID. So they're called IPOC or interprofessional outpatient clinics. Can you tell us what the IPOP clinics are all about and what your role is in the IPOP clinics? Yeah, so, um, I mean, obviously, it's still a bit of a work in progress and we're adapting as we learn more about COVID. But I think the original idea was to be able to support family physicians with what we expected to be quite a few patients that ended up with symptoms post-COVID. We knew that this was going to have to be multidisciplinary. we wanted to involve both, you know, uh, ourselves as medical doctors, but also uh, our physiotherapy colleagues, pharmacy, psychology, social work, you know, kind of, and and that has evolved as as we have assessed needs within the clinic. Um, we're still kind of hammering out our absolute vision and mission statement, but I'll I'll summarize. I think there's kind of four main goals or or aims of our clinic. The first being, uh, we want to make sure that if patients are having symptoms that they truly are related to COVID, uh, to long COVID or post COVID, whatever we're calling it. Um, Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of nonspecific symptoms that can be associated with long COVID, like fatigue, like brain fog, but those can also be associated with other conditions, thyroid dysfunction, um, You know, some of the dyspnea can be related to heart failure or uh, untreated asthma. And so 
part of, you know, the clinic is seeing either an MD or an, an NP. We have a nurse practitioner in the two Calgary clinics and identifying whether there's features of a patient's presentation that are concerning and that we would want to investigate before we said this is long COVID. Because to us, long COVID is a diagnosis of exclusion. We don't want to blame long COVID and miss something. So that's kind of the first goal. I think the second goal is to assist with symptom management where we can. Um, there's there's not a lot in terms of therapeutic options that have been studied at this point in long COVID. Um, but, you know, we're willing to work with patients and, and you know, lots of sinus problems, uh, lots of issues with dyspnea, you know, trying to help them come up with solutions for their symptoms. And we have a bit more time than say a family physician does to sit down with them and to come up with an action plan. I think number Number three would be to then connect them with community resources. So we have access to, for example, uh, community uh, rehab that helps us with COVID specific uh, symptoms. Um, so we can refer them to that. I know that the community rehab program also has access to a social worker that can help them with some issues that have arisen related to the changes in their, their functional status from, from COVID. Um, we have a pharmacist that works with us. So, you know, he can assist us with medication review with a specific look at kind of post COVID sim symptoms. And then I think the last goal would be that we have them in the clinic for about a, a year and follow up. If, if once we triage them and we see them on the first visit, we feel like they need to continue to be followed in the clinic. They stay with us for about a year. Um, and during that time, if we discover or we hear about treatments that are now more validated, we can then contact them, reach out to them and talk to them about initiating those treatments. And also we can talk to them about research studies that we're doing and whether they want to be involved in that. So I think it's got, it's not one goal. It's quite a few goals. That's probably more long winded than you wanted, but. Thanks, Jillian. And can you talk a little bit more about what it's like to support patients with long COVID in your practice? What are the common concerns that you see? And, you know, even outside of just the specific medical conditions that you've already mentioned, but, you know, what are what are the feelings that they have? And, you know, what, uh, what are they presenting like? So I think one of the hardest parts about long COVID is that we just don't know that much about it. And for the the kind of timing of recovery is something that patients are really concerned about because some are having symptoms kind of one year plus out from having COVID. Um, and it's really hard uh, to say like, we actually don't know. We don't know if you'll fully recover and we don't know when you will fully recover if you do. Um, so that seems to be a major concern of patients. And um, so we, you know, despite the fact that we don't have answers, we're trying to support them and say, you know, it's, it's not a race. It's going to be a long, long, um, time. Also, everybody's different and kind of supporting them in, in their symptoms. I think a lot of people feel like they're, I don't like the term, but they feel crazy. They're like, I was a completely normal person and I had what felt like a cold and now I'm dysfunction. Like I can't do the things that I wanted to do. And part of what we do and the nurse practitioners that we work with are very good at this is validating their symptoms. Um, so you know, we support them in all the ways that I highlighted kind of with the goals of the clinic, but it's also some, to some degree, emotional support because it's a long recovery process. And it's nice to have somebody that you're checking in with every once in a while. Um, we can give them tools to help them, some set kind of self-management tools uh, if we don't have specific symptomatic treatments and ways to help them measure uh, that they're actually improving or not. So a lot of them are like, I don't feel like I'm improving. And then we kind of get them to take a step back and say, well, where were you at three months ago? And they'll be like, oh, okay. Like maybe I am getting a little bit better. And sometimes having objective tools, like we, we had a guy that had no sense of smell. And so he was doing smell training and we actually gave him like a scale to use every day. And then he kind of summed it up at the end of the week. And then he could say, okay, yeah, actually I might be making some progress because it's really hard when you're in the thick of it to day to day see progress. That's such a great point. Thank you for uh, for bringing up that perspective. The next guest we have on our show is Dr. Alexandra Rendeli. She is a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at the University Health Network's Toronto Rehab. 
During her residency training and at the University of Toronto, she completed a year-long fellowship in health journalism through the Dalalana School of Public Health. Prior to attending McMaster Medical School, she worked as a sports journalist, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting to hear. Uh, currently, Dr. Randali is a musculoskeletal and sports medicine physiatrist with an inpatient and outpatient practice uh, as a, with a special interest in COVID rehabilitation. She advocates for rehabilitation and related topics as a freelance health journalist and is the host of MSK Matters, a medical education podcast. So, Dr. Rendley, some of our listeners may not know what a physiatrist is. Could you start by telling us about this type of medical practice and how you're able to use your experience to support patients with long COVID? Uh, and then how are, how are physiatrists positioned to support patients with long COVID in Ontario? Yeah, so I'm a physical medicine and rehab doctor. So that uh, spans uh, musculoskeletal and neurological um, disorders, patients that have had a prior diagnosis. And then my job is to come help improve their function and quality of life. So everything um, that I do with my patients is really centered upon what their goals are and trying to restore and improve their quality of life by helping them get back to the things that they enjoy. And that can include helping with adaptive aids or equipment, home setup, um, addressing the medical concerns, pain, uh, sleep, uh, looking at the mood component, the psychosocial support. So it really takes into account the entire patient um, and, and seeing how we can work with them as well as all of our allied health colleagues uh, and our medical uh, colleagues to get them back to a place where they're doing the things that they enjoy. And so transitioning to being a long COVID or just a COVID rehab physician has drawn on lots of different types of rehab that have really good uh, quality evidence in trying to repurpose that or use that with our patients who are struggling from post-COVID. So um, in the MS population, fatigue it tends to be something that is really common and, and decreased energy. So how can we draw on some of the research from MS um, in um, post-ICU conditions where we know that there's nerve injuries and muscle breakdown and, and weakness or post-ICU kind of intubation issues, swallowing. We're using all that literature to help this population. And one of the challenges um, is that it's really a, a diverse set of patients. So a post-ICU patient in their 40s is not the same as a post-ICU patient in their 80s, is different than a 30, 40, 60 year old who did not require hospitalization and had these mild symptoms and really is struggling, as Dr. Walsh said, several months out and feeling as though they don't know what's happening to them and their world is kind of crumbling. So Every patient is a unique um, opportunity to draw on all the skills we have in our rehab toolbox. And some of it at this point in time is a little bit of trial and error, but being explicit with our patients that, you know what, let's give this a try. It might not work for you in that collaborative approach. You let us know how this is going and then we'll move forward with it or we'll tweak it or we'll remove it really draws on our experience in rehab to help these long COVID um, patients. That's really great. And you've, you've already touched on this a little bit. So we know that long COVID can present with many different symptoms and, and at different times along that recovery spectrum. Can you tell us a little bit more about the most common concerns that come up with patients with long COVID? Yeah, um, and I think highlighting what you've said, that it can kind of come and go, and that really plays off the World Health Organization's definition uh, that was released in October 2021, that a symptom that they had initially might not be the symptoms that they're presenting with six or 12 months later, and so watching that evolution is important, and then um, again, to Dr. Walsh's point, they can have COVID and something else, so not forgetting to them kind of take a step back and say like, mm, this is a new symptom, it could still be long COVID, but let's make sure we're not missing something else. We've missed a lot of screening with um, clinics being shut down in early 2020. Is there age-related cancer screenings or something like that, that that haven't been done? So just always kind of keeping that lens. But in terms of the most common symptoms, overwhelming fatigue, um, by and large, is something that I've seen with almost every patient that comes through uh, the door. Um, in addition to some degree of uh, deconditioning and limited activity tolerance, 
So some of the early 2020 patients, I'd say breathlessness and more of the respiratory symptoms in this new kind of Omicron wave. And um, I must say, I'm not seeing a ton of post COVID yet from this, just have the nature of referrals, uh, but the lower respiratory tract was not as involved. So seeing a little bit less of that compared to um, some of the more headache issues. And then cognitive issues, that brain fog or COVID brain, we've seen a lot in the news with changes to attention and memory concentration affecting return to work and also return to school. Um, and then a lot of anxiety and depression, just changes in mental health, about at least 30%, if not closer to 50 um, of the patients that come through my program are having some degree of, of changes to their mental health and needing some additional supports with that. Thanks for sharing. Our next guest on the show today is Lauren Singh. Lauren is a physiotherapist and the clinical lead for the brand new post-COVID rehab team uh, based out of Community Accessible Rehabilitation, or you may hear it called CAR, and affiliated with the Long COVID Clinics for Southern Alberta. Lauren has supported the AHS COVID Rehab Task Force since the onset of the pandemic and has co-authored rehabilitation recommendations and clinical guidance documents to support individuals living with long COVID. Lauren, as COVID-19 was unfolding and relatively unknown, we didn't even consider that rehab would be part of the recovery from COVID-19. We now know that physiotherapists or PTs and occupational therapists or OTs uh, play a key role in supporting patients with long COVID. Can you talk to us a little bit about the different ways that PTs and OTs can support patients? And now that we're seeing more patients struggling with long COVID, what are the common things that you're seeing in your practice? Oh, big question. Um, I think rehab, now that we're looking at it as the pandemic, after the pandemic, and you know, you're talking about 200 different symptoms and the heterogeneity of presentation is we have to look at the heterogeneity of what a clinical team needs to look like. And so OTPT is really critical, but the broad understanding of what rehabilitation can entail, I think is important to get that message out there to referral sources and to general community, because it goes beyond just physical therapy as we traditionally understand it and occupational therapy as it's not widely understood um, unless you're working really in rehab and in that area. But then there's other pieces. And we've just heard about um, some of the mental health pieces or the loss of role and responsibility. And so we're looking at how do we have spiritual care practitioners help inform a patient's journey? How does rec therapy help modify how people are returning to joyful activity as a means to interface with some of that physical rehab that also needs to kind of occur? And so, you know, when we look at heterogeneous populations, we look at a heterogeneous like a heterogeneous treatment team. And so PTOT is big. Rec therapy is going to play a role. Social work is going to be critical. Psychology is critical. And so how are we all coming together to serve our patient in the best holistic way? And we categorize things by symptoms and it's a way to silo them and how to treat those certain pieces of them. At the end of the day, they're all housed in one human. And so what becomes a priority for treatment on a given day or on a given week is going to fluctuate just like the presentation of people's symptoms. So when we talk about the roles of everybody, I think a transdisciplinary model and how we operate together and provide care across the team and looking at the person as a whole is really critical. Um, and so PTOT is huge. And, I, you know, but social work is extremely critical in terms of illness adjustment. You know, we heard Dr. Walsh talk about how people go from having no symptoms, being healthy, we'll say, and then suddenly having this massive change in life status and what productivity looks like, whether that's employment or role and responsibility. And so how do you have someone participate actively in physical rehab or cognitive rehab, but they're also just, they're so far down a rabbit hole of chronicity and a change in life status and a change in understanding who they are. And so, it, and we see this in neuro rehab too, is how do you have psychosocial supports to try and you know, chicken or the egg, and how do you interface them both to support the person as a whole? So, I mean, I'll echo that we see lots of the similar symptoms um, that we've heard from our other two guests in terms of shortness of breath and fatigue and managing fatigue and trying to tease out, you know, is fatigue a byproduct of deconditioning, um, you know, or an ICU stay, or is fatigue a byproduct of exertional dysfunction? So, exertional malaise or exertional symptom exacerbation, because those are going to be managed very, very differently. So 
those are mainly the symptoms that we're that we're seeing. And then the cognitive piece. And that's really time for occupational therapy and speech and rec therapy to, to shine because they are so critical for developing programming for these patients. And we can't physically rehab somebody if they're overexerting themselves in a cognitive piece. So it's that balance of what can someone tolerate and how can we meet them where they're at. I love what you said about people being whole and, and really looking at treating that entire person. And, you know, it's so easy to segment it into, you know, this is a cardiac condition or this is a respiratory condition, but, you know, you're absolutely right in that we're, we're all whole people and, and all of that is housed in, in one body. Uh, Lauren, can you outline some of the different types of programs and services that are available to support long COVID, especially ones that we may not typically think of? Yeah, it's going to vary. Um depending upon where you are and where you're listening to this or viewing this from in terms of regions. Um, I'm obviously more familiar with Alberta and Calgary zone and probably Southern Alberta, but you know, there's going to be, there are clinics that support Alberta North and South and there's allied health that um, are integrated and multidisciplinary that uh, can be referral um, destinations for individuals. Um, within Alberta, we have the post-COVID functional scale, which helps us kind of triage the degree of care people need. And so we also have community programs, big plug for the Alberta Healthy Living Program that's available across the, uh, the province of Alberta, um, have done some really great work, really put out some great videos that give snapshots and give some frame of reference for people who are looking at themselves going, who am I? Where do I start? And is this common? Is this normal? And so that's broadly available on YouTube to individuals. Um, we've got more specialized clinics like Dr. Walsh's clinic in Calgary um, that can you know, be a, a hinge point for rehabilitation destinations based on presentation. And then there's the other things that require rehab that maybe, again, we never think about as needing rehab, whether that's pelvic floor dysfunction as a byproduct, byproduct of chronic cough or again, it's cognitive intervention. There's so many people that see rehab as exercise or graded exercise or physical intervention and physical rehab. But we have so many colleagues within rehab that can ameliorate so many other symptom presentations like swallowing or your brain fog or mental health and support. And we have clinicians. So rehab is always focused on function. And if people are finding that they're struggling with function, is there are rehab resources available to be able to support them. And then obviously we have um, a document that's been put out for Alberta. That's a self-management tool. And another big plug for the rehab advice line that's available to all Albertans to help. If you're really feeling like you don't know where to go or what to read or where to get help, that's a really great hinge point that has access to the whole province. You're just uh, sharing all of our resources. Thanks for uh, for promoting those there, Lauren. That was great. I, I'll uh, I'll pay you later for those. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> Definitely not. But uh, thanks thanks for the uh, the plug. Um, our next guest is Chris Burney. He's a healthcare professional with over ten years of progressive healthcare and leadership experience in both public and private settings. Uh, he's currently the senior implementation lead for the AHS post-COVID task force uh, and has been vital in securing funding and resources to support Albertans living with long COVID. His passion is developing an organizational culture focused on patient and family-centered care, collaboration, innovation, and engagement. Uh, Chris is also a physiotherapist, which will uh, secretly slide in there as well. Uh, so Chris, we're starting to see an increase in the numbers of patients with long COVID. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Sean, and thanks for having me today. And I, I think the title uh, is um, pretty accurate. So uh, the pandemic after the pandemic, and so as a HS post COVID task force, right now we're projecting uh, sort of our prevalence rate of over 110,000 patients here in Alberta already. And there's a couple of caveats with that, as we know the testing criteria and lack of PCR testing uh, in Alberta has has changed recently. So I think that's a pretty conservative number when you start to think about uh, using 110,000 based on the case counts as well. Some of the, the latest literature is actually showing um, there was a article that was produced by the Journal of Infectious Disease uh, two weeks ago that showed the prevalence rate in North America is actually uh, 31%. And so as a task force, we've been using uh, 20% as a conservative number for our prevalence rating. And so um, I think, again, the number of 110,000 may be on the uh, conservative and low side. 
But we're also seeing an uptick, as Dr. Walsh has talked about as well, at our um, long COVID specialty clinic. So uh, the latest update I received, we were receiving over 200 referrals to our clinic in a month. Um, and our clinics have seen almost over 1,000 patients already. So again, you can start to see that our wait lists are expanding there as well. And then our, our hits on the, on the internet on some of the resources that Lauren spoke to. And so we have a My Health Alberta page that has some resources. And in the last six months, we've had 120,000 hits on that one web page alone. Uh, we have a HHS external uh, provider page. So, so providers, we have around 30,000 providers that have accessed that website. Uh, we also have a patient page that's external facing from AHS, and we've had over 120,000 people visit that site. And as well, a lot of people may or may not know, we have a Google search campaign that we're doing to try to get our resources to the top of Google when individuals uh, search long COVID in Alberta. And so just in the, the amount of uh, time, uh, again, it's six months, we've generated 700,000 um, ads in that six-month time frame. So again, uh, I think long COVID is being searched quite a bit in Google these days. So all that said, um, I think uh, we're starting to see that influx in patients. Um, the awareness is, is slow coming, but I think it's out there now. And we're starting to see the results of our communications, the results of the media uh, attention that long COVID has, has received, and where we are in the, the pandemic right now. I think it's now really timely. So, yeah. That's great. Thanks for sharing all of those numbers, Chris. I think it's really important to see, you know, how much work is being done to support long COVID. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the media right now about Omicron. Uh, do you know anything about the prevalence of long COVID related to Omicron? Yeah, as both of our physician panelists have mentioned that um, the literature out there is still early about the, the Omicron variant. And I think um, in some of the clinics, just as we were speaking about that, Referrals are still kind of more um, of the previous variants. We haven't seen as many patients uh, with the, the more late Omicron variant. But from some of the literature that's saying is you can't just assume that because of it, it's a less severe variant that it's going to impact long COVID at a less, uh, lesser degree. So I think we all have to keep that in mind. Uh, the symptoms may look different. Um, again, we've heard today that there may not be as much of the respiratory component to the symptoms. But uh, we still need to be mindful that uh, these patients are out there and we may see an influx as well with this variant. That's uh, really great to bring up those points. I think, you know, we, we really don't know what's going to come down. And, you know, it's just being aware and being nimble and, and flexible to respond to, to what happens going forward. So on our first episode, I asked patients what they wish that healthcare providers knew about long COVID. So the most common themes that came up from their answers were that they wanted to be validated by their healthcare team. They're saying their tests might be normal, you know, but meet us with kindness and compassion. You know, we don't want to be sick and that there's a lot of shame around having the symptoms and asking for help. They asked for a check-in several weeks after their initial COVID-19 infection uh, to screen for long COVID. And for providers to be able to recognize the symptoms of long COVID and to screen for long COVID with tools like the, the post-COVID functional assessment screening tool that we have in Alberta or, or other tools across the country. Um, and then we know that patients with long COVID may not be able to advocate for their own needs or follow through with some of the steps on their recovery plan because of symptoms like fatigue and brain fog. So I'm going to throw it out to all of our panelists. What do you make of that? And uh, what, what do you want? patients to hear and return to, you know, what they're asking. Just a, a technical thing. Um, I'm not sure what they meant by several weeks after. The one thing that uh, we should just clarify is that long COVID is 12 weeks after, so three months. And the reason being for that is that, you know, the acute phase may not be over in two three weeks, three weeks, four weeks, right? So we have to have a, a cutoff. And so I totally hear what they're saying about following up and having people screen, but there is that, that we do want to wait that time to make sure that people do have persistent symptoms. So I just wanted to clarify that. And that's really great for sharing. I appreciate you jumping in on that because I think sometimes there's an, you know, a lack of understanding. Well, why, why do we have to wait 12 weeks? And so, you know, that's a really great explanation for what that waiting period is for is that it's not just an arbitrary number that was just thrown out there. So I appreciate that. Lauren, go ahead. 
Yeah, I echo that. Like the acute phase, for sure. I think sometimes people are just like, what? This has gone on for a really long time. And and I think there are some guidance in that time frame of how to take care of yourself and expectations from yourself that, you know, I, I would like to see broadly communicated. And I know patients that I've spoken to that have long COVID that wish had like wish they had access to that information when they were still trying to recover. Um, and there was this push to kind of get back to work and to to get back to activity. And, and so while I appreciate it's not a long COVID diagnosis and there has to be a cut point and it has to be persistent symptoms. And I, I agree. I think that's where a lot of our tools that exist in AHS and the RAL can support those patients that are like, I don't know, like, is this within normal limits? And it's fair for them to call and for someone to say, yeah, it's within normal limits, but here's some caveats associated with that. If you're feeling like your symptoms are recurring, if you're still feeling fatigued, it's important to respect that. Um, and I, and just to answer your question about the patient feedback is, yeah, I, I believe you. That's your narrative. And I believe you. I would just add to that, we always want to meet our patients with kindness and compassion. And so regardless of what they're bringing forward to us, for whatever reason, we want to hear their narrative and understand it from their perspective. And I think in rehab, that's why we always frame our um, encounters with kind of goals. So yes, you're experiencing this symptom and what is that preventing you from doing? And then... Um, really being open to saying like, we don't know. And I think that's been really hard for some clinicians, especially being a younger staff, um, having gone through residency more recently and wanting to always have the answers, but really we are learning alongside of our patients what this disease means. And um, shout out to all the researchers who have put out some really excellent research very quickly, but that is constantly evolving. And so also being able to shift your narrative and be like, okay, we tried this, this isn't working um, because the research has evolved is time consuming, but also important in order to make sure that we're bringing the right evidence forward for the right patient. And especially with the varying definitions of long COVID, making sure your patient kind of fits with what was done and whatever research you're kind of trying with that. But um, using that lens of saying like, I'm not really sure, let's work on this together, I'm going to get back to you, or let's let's look it up. Or a lot of patients have actually done a lot of research. So what have you looked into? What, what diagnostic test are you hoping that I'm going to tell you that we should be doing, right? Like also respecting that there's some very well-educated um, individuals and family members and supports that are um, doing all this digging on their behalf too. And so kind of uh, embracing that collaborative approach and you might have reasons for not necessarily going forward or access or this or that, but that is in and of itself is a therapeutic discussion that they're holding hope of like, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, like curing them, then you need to know where they're coming from because no matter what you put forward, they might not buy into that treatment plan if that's not what they're hoping for. And so I think there's a lot to work through with these patients and um, they can be very time consuming appointments, but that time ultimately is what's going to be better for them than one or two years down the road of seeing many, many therapists and just having these ongoing symptoms. Yeah, and just to build on that, I think the number one thing we hear from our patients with lived experience is for all of us as healthcare pro, uh, professionals is just to listen and acknowledge um, that this is a condition. Um, we have, you know, a lot of people that will face some of the healthcare providers. And yeah, I know Jillian, I don't like the word either, but, you know, are termed as crazy. Um, so I, I think um, a lot of it is to just listen, and that would be my advice as well. And then building off what Lauren was saying is that we do know that a high percentage of long COVID patients can recover utilizing some of those tools and self-management resources that we have. So again, trying to arm the patients between that zero and 12 week mark before they are officially considered uh, a long COVID patients with some of those self-management tools and guidance and resources rehab advice line, they may actually be able to recover on their own um, with some of those tools and some of those supports or with their uh, primary care provider. So again, really trying to get that awareness that those tools are out there between the time that they're diagnosed as long COVID or as a time they can come into one of our specialty clinics if they're there. 
That's a great point, Chris, is that, you know, we can be working on different things along the way. Um, So with that in mind, um, with other chronic conditions, we've got an accepted clinical practice guideline to to drive practice. Um, While there's typically differences between countries, there's generally an established standard of care. So for example, with diabetes, we know that there are certain things we need to do, such as reviewing a patient's blood pressure, their cholesterol. We perform annual vision checks and foot exams. There's this well laid out framework for what to assess when and, and why. But because COVID-19 is so new, we don't have a globally accepted way of treating and managing those long COVID symptoms. And we've, we've talked about this, we're, we're learning as we go. And, you know, I hate the analogy, but the kind of the, you know, we're building the airplane as we're flying it. And that, you know, we're learning a lot really quickly. And it's pretty amazing to see how medical care is advancing so quickly. Uh, but we don't have that globally accepted standard of how to treat long COVID. So how do we treat new conditions when there aren't necessarily COVID specialists? You know, our doctors didn't go to school to study long COVID for years and years, you know, prior to the pandemic. And, you know, there isn't a globally standard standardized pathway for care across the continuum. Uh, So how how do we treat patients without that in place? I'm going to start with the caveat that I'm only speaking from a medical perspective. From a rehab perspective, I will defer to my colleagues. Um, I think one of the the nice parts about the, the clinics being run out of kind of internal medicine is uh, we still have that broad approach of you know, we address multiple symptoms in in the best way we know how, but it really comes down to having a a cost benefit (laughs) discussion with the patient. So there's lots of things that we're studying. So the example that comes to mind is antihistamine use in patients with COVID, because there's some thought that maybe treating people with an antihistamine, you know, technically the, the evidence is quite small, I would say weak evidence, but at the same time, a daily antihistamine is not going to have a huge side effect profile. So when we have patients that are kind of at their wits end and they don't have anything else, having that discussion with them and saying, okay, there's some preliminary evidence. It's not great. And just being frank about it, but considering there's no side effects or low side effects, do you want to try this? Like, let's do a short-term trial. And so it's a matter of kind of the general supportive care and then for the right patient, maybe trying some things out, knowing, being very upfront that it is a trial and it may not help the situation. I think in general, like there are certain, you know, health management things that are are just across the board, whether you're post COVID or not. And so emphasizing those things and, you know, making sure that their screening is up to date for other conditions. I think those are the things that we can, say are should be part of the guidelines now the rest is developing and it's actually going to vary province to province like we're just starting talks now in Alberta with our Edmonton colleagues about actually putting together some guidelines um so you know it's coming but yeah uh, I I don't know about rehab though (laughs) I think we have a scale that we use for other disorders so I touched on this before but kind of drawing on other rehab um conditions that have really good evidence. So there is a pr- brief fatigue inventory. There is an FS36. There is citizen tests in terms of tracking progress with physiotherapy. Um, I do work with like SLP and registered dietitians and social workers and spiritual care. And so we all have the tools that we use on our inpatient and outpatient rehab um, wards in order to kind of track change and progress uh, from various conditions. So just pulling on those resources, depending on the symptoms uh, being there and then um, going with the flow when they're not fitting the trajectory. And I think that will help over time with these individual narratives that we're kind of seeing and then having discussions like this of what am I seeing in Ontario? What is Dr. Walsh seeing in Alberta? And are there commonalities? And that's where the research is, is going to head. Um, but this is how we are building the research in real time. Yeah, I agree. Um, We take these generally known commodities to treat certain functional impairments, and then we have to use an evidence-informed lens and apply it and be agile and be humble and be responsive when it works or it doesn't work and be open to using something else or applying a different treatment strategy and then trying to do as much due diligence as we can to try and limit the amount of harm. So, you know, we're always going to screen for post-exertional symptoms because if that's the case, then I'm not going to do a submax exercise test to see how someone does because 
how is that value add when I know it's not going to land? So it, it's taking those commodities and applying them more broadly. Um, and then again, because we don't have a lot of evidence that's specific to COVID, it's listening to the patient narrative and not just because that's therapeutic, but because that's the co-production of evidence in real time. And that's going to drive how you're going to be responsive and agile with your patient population. I really appreciate what all of you have said in terms of, of different ways of treating long COVID is that we're not recreating the wheel. We're not starting from scratch. You know, we have these tools and we have resources that we can use from different conditions. And it's how do we draw the parallels and the similarities between each of those uh, to be able to come up with a better option right now. Um, so what's the best advice that each of you have for other healthcare providers who maybe don't have as much experience in supporting patients with long COVID? I'm happy to jump in. Um, I would say there's some really great resources online, so you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Um, a few that come to mind, like the Long COVID website and World Physio, they have patient education handouts and YouTube videos and breathing exercises and um, very well done evidence-based research that can support patients. So connect with those that you do know are seeing COVID patients, um, see what resources they find useful, and then see if you can bring those forward. Listen to podcasts like this, attend webinars, kind of build your knowledge, because this is something that even if you are not working specifically in COVID, you're going to have patients for the next number of decades that have other diagnoses and then had COVID, and who knows what that's going to look like. Um, think of polio. We didn't see post-polio syndrome from the rehab world for like decades later. So um, you're going to need to know this information at some point, whether or not you're treating it directly or not. So get comfortable talking to those that do and don't try and just start fresh. There's some really amazing resources to, to pull from. I mean, I want to seem like I really know what I'm doing all the time, but the secret is that we also don't necessarily 100% of the time know what we're doing. So it's like, that's an okay feeling to have is apprehension. It's like when you go from being a resident to a physician and you realize that the staff didn't actually know everything. There's a little bit of, don't tell anybody, but there's a little bit of like trial and error. And so I think, you know, it's okay to be a bit apprehensive. I'm a bit apprehensive. And it's just a matter of, you know, looking for resources, reviewing the literature. And if we can help in the clinics, then we're happy to do so. Um. Yeah, I would echo that same comment. And as we've talked about before, first step is just listen, right? And acknowledge and listen. And then for the actual resources, again, going back to what we have here in Alberta for any of the providers that are on the line that are from Alberta is, again, Rehab Advice Line is a really good access point as well. Um, they'll accept calls from healthcare providers as well to help answer questions or wayfind. fine or help triage. So um, if you have some questions and you want to speak to an experienced occupational therapist or physiotherapist, call the rehab advice line. And I think Nicole, hopefully um, maybe you can put the number in the, in the chat box there, but that's a definitely a good start. If you're, if you're in Alberta, um, if you're from outside of Alberta, you can also look at our AHS provider page. And I believe Nicole's put that uh, link in the, in the box. So those would be two good, really good starts if um, for looking for information. I guess my my uh, advice for people out there that haven't had to manage long COVID is welcome to the club. And also, I don't know, we go into healthcare because we want to operate in altruistic and helpful ways. And at the end of the day, you're trying to serve your patient the best, that you, the best way you know how. And I think I'm going to get my rehab team t-shirts made with this on it. But it's the relationship is the intervention. And so in the absence, long COVID 2022, um, but in the absence of that relationship, and we know that in other areas of rehab is like, if you don't have a therapeutic relationship or rapport with your patient, the buy-in, the uptake, the longitudinal relationship required to get some form of therapeutic outcome is, it is non-existent. And so just remember that your relationship is your intervention when you're looking at this patient population and you don't know and they don't know, but you're on that exploratory journey together doing your best, both of you. 
Wonderful. So for those of you that we're going to turn this into a podcast. So for those of you that can't see the chat box, uh, our easy link is AHS. So Alberta Health Services, ahs.ca slash healthy after COVID. That is our patient page because it's a nice, easy to remember link. Uh, and there's a link on there that can direct you back to the provider page. So then you've got access to all of the resources that we've been talking about. Um, so a couple questions from our audience. I have one from Jeanette Deer. And she said, fatigue continues to be one of the most prevalent symptoms of long COVID. What objective tools are you using uh, to find out or uh, using or finding uh, that have been helpful in evaluating and assessing change over time? Um, the one the one caveat that I discuss with patients when I talk about fatigue is really narrowing in on what do they mean by fatigue. Sometimes I'll say to them, like, mental fatigue or physical fatigue because I think those are very different things um and and I think the way that we evaluate those are going to be different so for example if you're you're more mentally fatigued or brain fog um you know we might look at things like concentration and memory and ability you know length of time that you can stick with a task as opposed to physical fatigue we might actually look at you know how far can you go before you feel like you need to take a break and so I think it's important to clarify those those things and, and tease that out. Um, and now I will again defer to my physio colleagues. I'm going to defer this one to Dr. Rendley because Jeanette is asking the question and I've worked with her on trying to select what fatigue scales we're going to use when we build into our electronic health record. So she's, I've tried my best, but I think your opinion is really what we're looking for. We use the brief fatigue inventory as part of our uh, screen at the UHN um, multidisciplinary clinic that I'm a part of, and we have seen um, good results. So you want a higher score initially and you want it to go down as they improve. And so we have seen that positive change over time um, in the about 105, I believe, patients that we have full data sets on. Um, and then usually, like, I like to screen, like Dr. Walsh was saying, like, do you feel refreshed when you wake up? Is this more of like a sleep hygiene situation? And we're going to go into our sleep questions and napping and things like that. Or is it more from the cognitive piece? And um, our OT colleagues uh, kind of help with both sides of that spectrum versus the physical um, looking for post-exertional malaise versus can we go on more of a graded exercise routine and then um, building up with my physiotherapy colleagues kind of what that exercise prescription is going to look like for that patient. I will make a plug in here for how we look at it. Um, the front line of rehab is we're looking at fatigue is how it's impacting functional abilities and functional skill sets. And so we're using the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure or the COPM as a really critical piece of information in terms of goal setting, but it's also a gold standard of goal setting. So we can actually use it as an outcome measure um, to measure performance and satisfaction with different domains of self-care and productivity and leisure. And for us in rehab, we're looking at making collaborative goals. We want people to be able to return to things that have meaning and are ma and matter to them. And so the COPM is a, a really great tool to become familiar with, especially if you're dealing with a population that has non-specific broad spectrum functional impacts. Great, thank you. This next question might be more specific to Dr. Walsh and Dr. Randley. Um, through diagnosis of patients that have had COVID, so it sounds like they're assuming that you've done some screening, um, have you found any other health diseases that have contributed to their presentation? So things like Epstein-Barr virus. So it's kind of hard to know, like I've had this conversation about Epstein-Barr virus before because I think some naturopaths are doing um, titers on Epstein-Barr virus. The problem is it's not really going to tell you a whole lot unless, you know, you have positive IgM, in, in which case um, maybe they're, again, that's kind of the whole 12 week thing is like they, then it's not a matter of kind of them having long COVID, they may actually have Epstein-Barr as opposed to long COVID. Um, if you just have a positive IgG, all it tells us is that you've had Epstein-Barr in the past. So it's hard to, to know what to make of that. And we could test for it, but I think, honestly, it won't change what we do because it's not as if we have targeted therapies to Epstein-Barr either. Um, it's mostly supportive care, which is what we're doing a lot for COVID. Um, there's a common misconception, I would say, that 
the risk of clot is higher in the post COVID period. Um, so I just wanted to address that because the more recent studies are showing that it's not actually like that much of a risk factor being kind of post COVID, obviously acute COVID yes, risk factor for clots, but post COVID not. Um, I think conditions that we're seeing that maybe kind of get labeled as long COVID until we see them in clinic. Maybe that's the question I'm trying to address. Um, heart failure, dysfunctional breathing. Uh, and I think the community rehab people can talk more about that, but there is a known, um, effect of COVID that it almost changes the way you breathe. And that in itself, um, I believe it makes you it more shallow. So that in itself can make you feel like you're more, or you're still having symptoms of COVID. Um, thyroid issues we've seen because they are so nonspecific. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, it's a wide spectrum. The one thing, the other thing that I was reading about too, and, um, is that people that tend to have cognitive or sorry, um, mental health issues pre COVID are more likely to then present with mental health symptoms as part of their long COVID. So something to keep in mind. Um, it's not to say that like, if you have mental health issues, that's what's causing your long COVID symptoms. There's just a correlation between those two things. Um, yeah. Do you have any other thoughts to add to that, Dr. Rendley? No, I, I completely agree. You do want to screen for other things, but ones that have supportive care, I agree. Are you going to look for titers that aren't going to manage change? So uh, being on the rehab end, most of my patients have had extensive medical workups looking for that COVID plus something else. So my job often is to demedicalize and say that we don't need further investigations and we need, we are reassured by an echo or a stress test or a full jar that we're not missing anything else. And so how do we now cope with those symptoms? And that goes back to what Lauren was saying with the goal setting or setting smart goals and using the framework to kind of figure out where we get them back to without necessarily redoing workups or repeating things every few months just to quote unquote, make sure there's no change. So um, I often decrease the amount of investigations that I do as opposed to add to it. Yeah, I just, I'm going to echo that in the sense of, I think sometimes patients come in with an expectation of a, a certain test that should be done. And we really do have to think about how we're ordering tests. Um, you know, for example, people talk about their heart racing. Well, if you're not having an episode every day, there may not be any value in getting a 24 hour holter because we might not catch it. And then I can't actually say that you don't have it because we just didn't catch it. And so being thoughtful with our tests because, and maybe this is my health economics hat coming out here. You know, we want to have the resources to provide to people with long COVID. And every time I order a test, even though it's a big, you know, global AHS budget, it does take away. And so um, it's not a matter of we're trying to hold anything back. We're just trying to be really thoughtful with how we order tests. Thank you. Yeah, I like the, you know, being intentional and being deliberate versus holding holding back the services. Uh, on the first show, I asked the patients that they interviewed the question of what do you wish healthcare providers knew about long COVID? I'm going to flip that and I'm going to ask that in the opposite way and ask each of you, what do you wish that patients knew about long COVID? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I... I wish they knew that they were not as alone as they as they often present as that there is a whole cohort of individuals that are experiencing something similar and it doesn't make it any better but they're not alone and they're not an isolated um individual and that there are resources in place to help support them and I guess some of the people I guess it's not even long COVID at that point people are pretty persistent but I will say people that contract COVID and if they are symptomatic I, I wish they knew the I, I wish people knew the push crash cycle I wish people understood that trying to return to everything all at once is is maybe not the best play that the societal expectation that you suck it up and move on is is unreasonable in this population because it can do more harm than good and i i that is something i broadcast widely to everybody that gets covid i'm like just listen if you're symptomatic like i just think you should just take it easy and and rest um because i know that when i got it and i was unvaccinated i had a really hard time coming back to work and coming back to life and i lost a lot of my physical fitness and my cognitive endurance. And that was a huge struggle for me. And I knew 
all of this. And so I only did, I laid down for I don't know, months. And it's just, there are ways to help support you and manage you. So we can try and like stabilize your symptoms and that this push to return is maybe not always in your best interest because it, it might hurt you down the line, but there are resources in place. And if you are wondering if it's normal, call the rehab advice line, please. Chris, what about you? Yeah, my biggest thing is I hope that more and more long COVID patients know about the resources. I hate to go back to that. Like, you know, we've all talked about the resources, but I think uh, knowing that one in Alberta, that we have a task force that is advocating for you and knowing that we're working behind the scenes to do all that we can to get resources and get our clinics up and running and et cetera. So to know that we're there, that there's someone uh, trying to advocate support and that we have the resources, I think those would be the, the biggest things from my end. How about we pass it off to Dr. Vendely? Yeah, I like what Lauren said, you're not alone. I feel like just that validation to the patients when they come. And if I can say, like, I've heard this type of story or this description, and they're somewhat shocked, they really feel like they're going through this independently. So just raising ongoing awareness. Um, and really that you you really should feel supported and that you are receiving compassionate, kind care. I don't know, that really stood out to me as, as something that you said that patients want to feel. And um, I hope that all patients feel like they're getting that care for, from all their providers. So even if that's not being conveyed in the way that maybe they would want, they all their physicians are listening and trying to put um, their lens and their training and their knowledge to help them. And if they don't have the answers, that's also sometimes beneficial that you've been to a cardiologist or a respirologist or whomever. And if everything comes back within normal, then that in and of itself is also helpful that can help you move forward. So I think patients um, sometimes don't necessarily see the whole picture from our side because they're not living in our our side of the desk and not every physician has the time or just the bedside way of explaining every absence of, of diagnostics leading to their results but that um, at the end of the day that negative tests are beneficial and helpful in, in providing and so we are there to support them if they feel like they're not getting that elsewhere. And Dr. Walsh we'll wrap it up with you. Oh no pressure hey. Um, None at all. I'm going to echo everything that my colleagues have said, um, especially uh, at the end there when we were talking about, you know, it's actually, I, I know the patients want answers, but, you know, if your thyroid is normal, that's actually a good thing because chances are you probably still have long COVID, but you also now then had a thyroid problem. So like it is a, a good thing for tests to be negative. Um, you know, just it, to avoid repeating anything. I think one of the things that I actually talk to patients a lot at that kind of surprised me is sometimes the fear of actually getting vaccines after having long COVID. And, uh, you know, we again have limited evidence, but from, from the studies that have been done, it seems as if the vaccines don't lead to any deterioration. And so people should not be afraid. Um, anecdotally, you know, I would say a large portion of the people that we are seeing aren't vaccinated. And I, and so if you're getting kind of long COVID already, and then you get it again in the absence of a vaccine, you, we already know that you're going to be predisposed to having long COVID symptoms, if that sort of makes sense. And so prevention is obviously the best form of treatment. And I understand that like, you know, they've been, this is the, the message. I just maybe am supporting it one more time. Wonderful. I so we're, Go ahead. I agree. If you don't, if you're concerned about long COVID, try to not get COVID. And the best way to do that is with vaccines. Um, and we know now that fully vaccinated is actually the third dose and in some populations even four. So even with confusing messaging from public health guidelines across Canada, the vaccines are so important and masking is still super important. So as much as you can prevent COVID, you can try and help prevent long COVID. 
Thank you. Great, uh, great message there. And, and absolutely right. Uh, we're just about out of time here today. So that wraps up our show. A huge thank you to all of our guests, to Dr. Rendley, to Lauren Singh, Chris Burney, and Dr. Walsh. Uh, I can't thank the four of you enough for coming on the show and, and sharing your wisdom and your experiences uh, about working with patients who have long COVID. Um, by learning how long COVID is being managed across the spectrum of care, we're able to work together and come up with more innovative and creative ways to support this growing area, which is unfortunate that it is growing, but uh, that is the, the climate that we're in right now. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's taken the time to join us and to listen in. Uh, this is episode two of four of our webinar series. So we hope that you'll take this information and share it with your colleagues. If you work with patients or if you're a patient that you share it with your friends uh, and that you use the resources that we've talked about on this show. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks for joining us today. Together, we do amazing things every day.